last storyteller, Sue Ellen Hampkins. Sue Ellen is a psychiatrist, a teacher, and an author. She is the assistant director of the Center of Counseling and Psychological Health at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the adjunct clinical assistant professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. Sue Ellen has a special interest in narrative psychiatry, uh, college students' mental health, and mother-daughter relationships. She has co-authored a book called The Mother-Daughter Project, which talks about how mothers and daughters can bond together and thrive through adolescence. Her most recent book, The Art of Narrative Psychiatry, brings alive the use of narrative practices in the context of psychiatry. Today, at a room full of stories, Sue Ellen will be sharing with us creatively, uh, creative and emotionally attuned ways to cultivate and document narratives of strength and meaning in initial psychiatric consultations and creating collaborative treatment plans that honor the person's vision and values. Sue Ellen, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. So it's really an honor to be here, and I, I want to especially thank everyone from Amid for inviting me and making me feel so uh, welcome, and also a special thanks to Peggy Sachs, without whom I wouldn't be here either. So um, I'm going to be talking today about um, uh, initial psychiatric consultation, and I've chosen to share a story with you of someone who's dealing with some really pretty severe and worrisome problems to really show how we can use narrative practices and remain in an in a, uh, influential but decentered position even when people are facing really serious kinds of problems. So what I'd like to do is uh, introduce you first of all to um, Martin Smith. This is a pseudonym. So Martin uh, arrived in my office in October 2014, um, two years ago. Uh, he's an uh, 18-year-old 18 year European-American man, had short um, blonde hair, he's about five foot nine inches, and he kind of shook my hand very firmly and sat down and was drumming his fingers on his legs when he first came in. And he'd been referred to me by one of the psychotherapists at the college counseling service where I work. So currently I work at the University of Massachusetts, a university of 28,000 students, and I'm one of the psychiatrists there working with students in the student counseling center. That therapist was worried because uh, Martin was hut, um, hitting and cutting himself, at times became overcome with anger, and was having violent fantasies about maiming or killing other people and himself. So um, she was pretty worried about him. So Martin's in my office kind of looking around, you know, kind of looking kind of wary, and I kind of felt, you know, a clench in my own gut, because I'm like, ugh. Not only am I thinking, how can I be helpful to Martin, I'm also thinking about those 28,000 other students on the campus, especially in light of these different kinds of campus shootings in the United States that have been happening. So um, I was especially grateful at this kind of a moment to have the support of narrative practices to, uh, to help me out. So when I think about narrative psychiatry, um, I, you know, it, it, it holds the same values as narrative therapy in terms of uh, the way in which we experience our lives and identities through stories and the power of meaning making in human experiences, the way in which meaning is made and stories arise in human relationships and about uh, uh, power in those relationships as well. And it also is really paying attention to the way in which we're embodied creatures and we all have biological strengths and vulnerabilities that also influence our experiences in the world. So another way to, to think about the way I think about the work is rather than focusing primarily on finding the source of the problem, I'm also interested in finding sources of strength and meaning in, uh, in people's lives. And um, I first came to narrative practices um, in 1998, and it was really meaningful to me from the very beginning because it was really based on values that I cherish myself. Uh, in particular, that it's deeply respectful of each person and their own vision and values, what they care about. It values working collaboratively with people uh, in treatment. It questions narratives of uh, power and operations in society that are harmful to people. Uh, and it also, it never gives up hope that healing is possible, which is really important to me. And finally, it never obscures um, the person. Uh, it never um, lets the problem obscure who the person is without the problem. Because all of us have problems, and we also all have beautiful souls and magnificent talents and um, compelling uh, intentions uh, in our lives. So what I would say is that another way to think about this is although Leo Tolstoy said happy families 
are all alike and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Working, when I think narratively, it's really that happy families are all different and every happy family is happy in its own way. And this is kind of the essence of what it is that we're seeking and setting out to uh, discover. So in this initial consultation with Martin, um, I'm paying attention to the two responsibilities we have um, uh, that I have as a psychiatrist that many doctors or clinicians have. And so one is we're trying to create a therapeutic experience for the person who's consulting with us um, so that it's a healing experience that they're having. And we're also trying to find out about the nature of the problem that someone's experiencing and what might help them uh, overcome it at the same time. And the psychiatric consultation or any kind of initial consultation that any of us have in any of our fields with the person is generating a narrative about a person's identity. And we want that narrative to be a healing narrative that helps um, uh, give them additional uh, possibilities for uh, recovery. So, um, uh, in addition, we're, we're responsible for understanding the nature of someone's problem, and as a physician, I'm uh, responsible for finding out, is there a biological component to what someone's experiencing? Is there a psychiatric component? And if so, what might that be, and how might that play out over time, and how can we understand that? How can we uh, understand that in a, in a way that might be useful? So, um, and in a collaborative way. Um, so, luckily, it's not hard to do both these things at the same time have a healing conversation and also um, gather information. So the way that I organize my own thinking when I'm doing uh, the work is, to, is, is in these five uh, key practices. So the first one is focusing on connection and emotional attunement. And this is what I'm following every, every moment. I'm always paying attention to what's happening in terms of how someone is feeling and do they feel me feeling them. Um, then I want to get to know the person without the problem. We've all talked about this, talking about, um, David and Laurie talked about the wonderfulnesses of people. It's the same, uh, the same idea, it's what Scott was talking about. Getting to, know, getting to know that person, what they care about, what's their vision of well-being. Understanding their experience of the problem, seeing the problem in an externalized way. Um, and then developing stories of strength and meaning, narratives of resiliency and deconstructing harmful stories. And then collaboratively um, considering next steps in light of what the person cares about. So this isn't a, any, at all linear uh, in my mind. I'm, I'm kind of moving back and forth among all these different, all these different elements. Um, and you can hear this in, in terms of my work with um, uh, Martin today. And uh, I want to mention Martin has given me permission to share his story with you uh, 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 here today. And, um, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about him. So this is what I'm thinking first of all as he's sitting there in my office drumming his fingers on his knees is, is both getting to know him a little bit uh, without the problem and connecting with him. And uh, so he was a first year student so uh, I could ask him what direction his studies were going in and he said that he was um, majoring in English and film and he, um, his intention was to become a novelist. That's what he really cared about, the direction he wanted to go in. And we could linger here a little bit and talk about uh, himself as a writer, the kind of writing he was doing uh, currently, uh, and so on. So when we're working with someone who's, who's dealing with these more severe problems, whether they're psychosis or threat of suicide or threat of violence, um, it's always important to get to know the person without the problem, but it's especially important in these contexts because it always provides the foundation and the frame from which we're going to stand on to help cultivate and move in directions that is, uh, are going to be more preferred for that person. So then I moved on to ask him about what his hopes were for our first meeting. And he says, I'm hoping you can tell me what to do with my meds and to find a solution for the issues I've been dealing with. I've been using Celexa 20 milligrams since July in the hopes it could mitigate my depression. So he makes, he makes this particular um, statement. And um, I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to use the, I'm gonna use the um, statement of physician math to help me understand how he's thinking about the problem. So when we're externalizing and taking a position on the problem, we want to get an externalized and experienced near description of the problem, understand the problem's operations and effects, and then compare those operations and effects with the person's own goals and values. So with Martin, 
Um, I hear he's already has an externalized way that he's referring to the problem. He used the word depression. So I ask him, what's the depression like for him? What he says is, well, usually it's apathy and hopelessness, but now I'm also having anger issues. I'm concerned that the medicine is lowering my inhibitions and my anger is out of proportion to the situations that I'm facing. I say, I'd like to understand more what your experience is of the depression and anger. So we mentioned anger also, and I'm bringing that into our conversation. So he says, with the anger, with this, excuse me, with the depression, it's as if I'm on a boat, sometimes just ordinarily riding the waves, but sometimes I get caught in a storm and I get tossed out of the boat. And you can hear him as a, as a writer developing a very rich metaphor here about the boat. He says, I struggle to stay above the surface, desperately clinging to sanity, and all there's darkness and apathy. If I slip below, I don't care about anything at all. When I'm stu struggling for the surface, it's all despair and pain. But when I give up the struggle, it's numbing. This past spring, I had good friends, good work, things I enjoy, but the depression and anger could still be overpowering. That was the first time I engaged in self-harm, hitting myself, hitting the wall, cutting myself to get some relief. He goes on to say, I've always done martial arts. I found that hitting my hands against hard objects deadens the nerves and gives me relief. I take this opportunity at this moment to ask him about suicide since it had been something that was mentioned. And he says, I have passing suicidal thoughts, but I know they are pointless and stupid. I would not actually do it. It would crush my parents. That's not an option for me. <clears throat> um, so that's, that, which was a really reassuring thing for him to say. In other words, he's not acting on his, he's not acting on his um, suicidal urges because of value he holds, of not wanting to hurt his family and his parents. He goes on to say, when I get that overpowering anger, I have violent images of unleashing my martial arts capabilities against someone, even someone who's just mildly irritating to me. So I ask him, and have you ever acted on these images of violence? So I'm prepared to hear either yes or no at this moment, and either one would, would put me in a position to further explore how what's happening compares to his values and what he really cares about. So if he says, yes, I've acted on these violent images, that could be considered a continuation of the problem. And I'd be able to ask him, how did that suit him? Did it suit him to act in that violent way, or did it not? Um, if he says no, I can ask him about um, why not and what was he staying true to and generate and move into a different kind of narrative rather than the narrative of drowning under the depression and anger uh, and, and sort of floundering and foundering uh, in the water. So what I'm doing, what, I'm, what I'll be doing is really cultivating a narrative of uh, strength and meaning, a narrative of uh, resiliency is what I'm looking to do. And I'll be drawing on, in doing this, the reauthoring uh, conversations map. I'll be p paying attention to both the landscape of action, which is what happened, the, the events, um, when, how, with whom, so that can include events, skills, knowledge, relationships, resources, and so on. So I'll be looking at developing a nice, uh, history of the events of that resistance, and then also the landscape of meaning, which is why, or the plot or theme that can connect those elements into a narrative. So if we think of a narrative, our events over time connected by a plot or theme. So the why includes intentions, values, vision, hopes, dreams, and commitments. So this will be what I'm interested in cultivating with him. So to go back to his question, and have you ever acted on those images of violence? What he says is, no, which is a relief to me. Uh, it's, it's, it's easier. So I go back to it and ask him, you've never acted on the violent urges. How have you been able to do that? What did you do to manage the anger? So in asking those kinds of questions, I'm really interested in fleshing out the landscape of action. In other words, getting more of the events uh, that uh, illustrate what he was doing. And he says, mostly I try to vent it in some way. So he makes a pretty brief answer, and I want to ask him for more detail to really flesh out what he's doing. 
So he goes on to give me a lot of details of the things he does when he vents. I'm going to let you read that while I sneakily get a sip of water. Like Scott. Pardon? Oh. Sorry. So he talks about the ways in which he's um, uh, exercising, riding his bike, singing. He really loves to sing. He, um, he sings like Nora Jones songs, um, reading or writing, culling with his dog, and so on. So he gives me a nice full description of all the things that he does to try to handle the anger when it comes on. So after I get a nice description, then I can ask him, not acting on the violence, is that linked to any values that you have? So that's moving back into the landscape of meaning. And what he says is, actually, I'm a pacifist, except for self-defense. I believe you can resolve issues in a more productive way. So, um, so this is a, an entirely new narrative that's come forward that hadn't arisen out of his initial conversations with his, the, the person who referred him to me, who was really worried that he was going to actually um, uh, kind of have a violent rampage of some kind because of these violent images he was, he was having. He goes on to say, um, since I started the Selexa, I'm, feel, I'm not feeling apathy, but I've been struggling to keep myself from fury and rage. I've had anger issues since I was a kid. It's always been an issue. And the worst case was last week. I felt like I couldn't talk with anyone for fear of snapping. I was seething. I tried to keep a poker face. I couldn't focus on my work. I felt ill, like a rat on fire was gnawing in my stomach. You can really hear this, the, his powerful metaphors. So, so I'm, I'm, I've, I, you know, I heard the pacifist thing, and it's like it's right there. But he's going back into talking about the challenges he's facing. So in, in the interest of attunement, I follow him um, back uh, to that place. And I ask him, how did you deal with that? Um, and he goes on to say, I tried to vent it into writing, but I couldn't. So I hurled chopsticks at the door. Then I sprinted on my bike. At midnight, I started screaming. And the idea was to work myself into exhaustion. <coughs> um, he finally beat on the wall and cut himself and felt better. So we return back to um, the question of, um, are you worried that you might act on your anger? Because I really, I, you know, it sounds pretty extreme what he's dealing with. And he says, partly worried, but mostly I feel sick. I get these images of brutality, of beating someone to death, but I know I won't. So I can ask him, how? How do you know that you won't do it? And he says, I'm a martial artist, and you never start with violence. There's a tenant. If you're in a violent situation, you can run away, do it. If you can't run away, injure the person. If you can't injure them, maim them. If you can't maim them, only as a last resort, kill them. So I'm able to say, you sound clear about your commitment to not using violence. And he goes on to say, I was bullied all of my life. I was excluded and taunted. For years, there was a game at my school of throwing things at the back of my head like basketballs or other objects, but I responded with pacifism. And he says a bit more about that. I talk with him about these experiences. And I return to this question. With all that, you responded with pacifism. What are the roots of pacifism in your life? So I'm trying to extend this story back farther, this story of pacifism in his life. And he would say, he said, I would say, family values. In dealing with the bullying, my mother would say to me, do what Jesus did and turn the other cheek. He goes on to say, I personally am inspired by Gandhi and Buddha. They had the right idea. Be peaceful. If people see you act with violence, that reputation never goes away. If I ever did engage in any kind of violence, it would permanently change how people saw me, and I don't want that. So how are we feeling at this point about Martin's risk for acting on these violent images? We're feeling, pretty, we're feeling pretty reassured. He's been able to really articulate in a very deep way this whole other narrative that's, that's very grounded, not only in his family values, but also in his own spiritual values that he's incorporated. And that he's been, he takes many steps and is really active, including coming to consult with me and to say, hey, I think maybe my medicine is off. Uh, with me. So then I'm able to work with him to um, 
uh, take some steps to uh, see if there's something that we can do to help uh, address this uh, issue. Um, so in um, collaborative treatment planning, I'm interested in what his values and his vision are of using resources. And now, uh, we know that most of the resources he's using are not psychiatric resources. He has his singing, he has time with his friends, he goes out exercising, there's many, many things he's doing that are not psychiatric resources. So that's an important part of what the treatment plan is. But in addition, there may be psychiatric resources that may be useful for him or we can adjust um, what's happening. Okay. Um, and in this, I'm interested in being in a, in a uh, decent, influential but decentered position while I do it. So when I'm working with narrative uh, psychopharmacology, um, what I, what I want to do is that as paying attention to the way in which the person's experience of the medicine depends both on the medicine's biological effects and also on the meanings that the person gives to those effects. And in this, we can have conversations that move between the physical effects of the medicine, which is the landscape of action, and the meanings the person ascribes, which is the landscape of meaning, as we're having these kinds of conversations. So sample questions that we can use that are in the landscape of action are, did you decide to try the medicine? What has it been like? What effects are you noticing? So they're reflecting on the physical aspects of what is actually happening when they take the medicine. Um, and, I mean, this is not, there's, there's many other kinds of questions you could ask like this. And then you can move into a landscape of meaning questions, which can include um, what has been positive about it? What negative effects are you experiencing? And how do these effects suit you? We can ask, is there anything you value in yourself that's more available when you use this medicine, and if so, what? And how do you experience it being more available to you? Or we can ask, finally, does it seem to you the benefits of this resource outweigh the negative effects or not? And what does your choice to use this resource say about what's important to you? And so resource can be medicine. It also can be psychotherapy. It also could be any resource that someone's using. You can ask these same kind of questions. So in this, the idea of compliance has to do with how well is the doctor complying with the person's preferences in, in discussing medication options, which is the opposite of how I was originally trained to do it. Um, so, and the other thing to keep in mind is medicines are never the reason that someone's able to take uh, uh, action in their life. The, their, their ability to take action is always due to their own talents, abilities, and resources. The medicine might make those things more available, but Martin being able to be a great writer or be a committed pacifist has nothing to do with the medicine. The medicine might make those things more available, but they are not the cause or the reason. So Martin and I had a conversation about the medicine, and ultimately he decided to taper off the medicine altogether. And at a follow-up two weeks later, he said his anger was much better, but the depression was now worse, with low energy. He was finding comfort in continuing to sing and so on. We decided, he decided to just see how things went over the next few weeks. And then um, uh, he came back and said it's even actually worse. And he wanted to try a different antidepressant because he was feeling um, so weighed down and his, he, he was having a hard time functioning. So we tried a different uh, kind of antidepressant uh, altogether. And he felt he had more access to, uh, uh, he had a, a decrease in the depression, apathy, um, and anger. So this, this new medicine actually decreased the anger along with the depression. And he was able to find that he also had access to joy and energy and motivation and the violent images decreased. And uh, he could have more access to the creative and playful parts of his uh, personality. And so he ultimately recovered um, completely from uh, the depression altogether um, and uh, uh, over the next uh, two years. So, um, uh, oops, I lost my place. <laughs> oh, and he, um, he made a really warm circle of friends and, uh, you know, continued to develop as a writer and his circle of friends had these fun traditions that they had. So, for example, at the last time I uh, met with him was on a Friday and he came in wearing this really, you know, dashing uh, fedora and, you know, I commented on, on his hat that he was wearing. He's like, oh yes, well we have this tradition called Fedora Fridays and, and every Friday we all, me and my friends all wear fedoras. So that's really a, a, 
Martin's story as a way of illustrating how using narrative practices to bring forward these alternative stories of what people really care about, about their own moral and ethical stance, can be really powerful when they're facing these really more extreme kinds of problems. So in summary, really what we're doing in narrative practice in general, in narrative psychiatry is cultivating narratives of resiliency. We're really noticing, even when the problem seems to dominate the whole person, that we can help the person grow and cultivate. And so even if the problem remains really active, the person can still flourish and grow and hopefully ultimately really become uh, more fully embody their own vision and values of what they want their lives to be like. So thank you. Oh, I um, and I also wanted to mention uh, before questions that I'm going to be leading a two-day workshop in narrative psychiatry that will go through a, a lot of different practices. Um, it, it, the workshop will be, um, so it's Monday and Tuesday, there's still a few openings. Um, and it'll be a co combination of me uh, doing some, sharing some cases stories like this, then doing demonstrations with volunteers, and then experiential exercises to practice different elements of, of uh, basically it's narrative therapy in psychiatric contexts for narrative psychiatry. Thank you, Suelen. You're welcome. Um, can we open it up for some questions? Any thoughts, reflections, questions? Um, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, we are very new in narrative therapy. Uh -huh. So <laughs> kind of, uh, we were trying to get a on it and uh, we were a little lost, but you walked us through so beautifully. It, uh, it would have been better if he, your session was the first session, <laughs> uh, but uh, really thank you. And uh, it made sense, a lot of sense. And um, now we can all go back and understand a lot of more concepts too. Thank oh, great! You. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad. It, I'm glad it made it make sense. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah. Uh, usually, uh, people who go have psychiatric uh, illnesses, they res resist themselves to go to a psychiatrist, and they feel they are normal. So, does this therapy happen with the caretaker initially, and then? Uh, bring the patient to the, uh, because from what I've seen a, li a little bit personally, uh, they refuse to go to a doctor or a psychiatrist, uh, and especially over here with the taboo that, you know, if you. Right, when there's more of a taboo, yes. people so, don't want to go. Yes. Because of stigma. Yeah, and even, uh, mm -hmm. I, think, I think in India, there is a lot of stigma to go to a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Of course, now there is still, stigma. so how, so does this therapy even work with the, family first and then you know, get the patient involved or something? Um, sh yeah, y yeah, whatever is going to be most helpful for the, for the person. So if the person themselves doesn't want to come into therapy, you can work with family. I've worked with parents who, who are talking about um, even their young adult who might, uh, might uh, need help. Um, sometimes the most compelling way to get someone in is to say your, your parents are worried and it would ease their mind if you would come in and have a conversation. So out of compassion for your parents, would you be willing to come you know, and have a conversation? And, uh, and usually once, uh, once someone's in the room, then the conversation starts with what they care about, the person without the problem, what they're interested in, and they can um, you know, begin with that. And then you can talk about, when you stay with an experience near, description of the problem, the problem might be not that they're hearing voices or that they're terribly depressed, but that their parents are worried about them and are bothering them all the time. That might be the problem. And so then that's where you start. Oh, well, what's, what's happening with that? And, and uh, is there something that we can do about that if that's what the problem is from someone's own point of view? So that would be the way I would work with that kind of situation, stay in a very experienced near description of the problem and and kind of move in that way. That's very much like um, what the physical therapist talked about. I'm sorry, I forgot, I don't know where she is. Yes, um, about the child who didn't want to do the exercises for the hand, and, but when talked about, well, what would make your mother happy if I made progress? And so then was motivated. So it would be a similar sort of idea. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So I, I was, uh, firstly, Sue Ellen, thank you so much. And I want to say that um, I decided to learn about narrative practices because of your book. So uh, yeah. that was a great yeah. beginning. Uh -huh. And um, I, I actually was wondering about how much a part of psychiatric or medical um, practice, uh, narrative therapy or narrative practices have, uh, how much of that, that has entered the mainstream psychiatry and, uh -huh. you know, in terms of training, CMEs, do you see invitations to um, this way of thinking and engaging with patients happening more? Is there a movement towards that? Well, it's a very young embryonic movement, I guess I would say. Um, I mean, I've done trainings um, myself that have included CMEs in the United States. Um, uh, and um, I mean, usually when psychiatrists are exposed to these ideas, when I do train, they're very enthusiastic about it, actually. Um, but they're in the kind of broader, like at the American Psychiatric Association, I've done presentations there, but they haven't always accepted my proposals. Um, there's, um, there's been a bit of a movement in psychiatry of something called positive psychiatry, which narrative could really be, you know, sort of a part of. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm interested in trying to, um, uh, you know, sort of make headway. People are reading my book and starting to incorporate some of the uh, ideas. It's called The Art of Narrative Psychiatry. It's published by Oxford in 2013. So there's, I think there's a bit of movement. I mean, the pe I think, I mean, the great thing about working this way is not only do the people who consult with us love working this way, it is so, it makes the work so much easier. It, you're always focusing on what's positive, on the small developments and the exceptions, and on people's values in their lives. And so I feel so much less tired and burnt out. Even when I'm working with people with tremendously difficult problems, there's always, I'm always focusing on the steps that they're taking, even if they're tiny, or the steps they're thinking they might possibly be able to take, and the history of that hope in their lives. So it's positive, but I wouldn't say there's like, you know, I, you know I, I'm trying to be a little wedge, I'm a little wedge in, in the field of psychiatry. Okay, one last question. Uh, oh, yeah, hi. Uh, there was one question I've been using, drama and movement, that's mm -hmm. pretty much the sesame approach, which allows for narratives. And when I did use it with a population who were experiencing schizophrenia, uh -huh. there was one internal supervisor asking me, that's m myself, are we aiding the fantasy in the narrative? Mm -hmm. What is that thin line? Where, yeah. where mm -hmm. are we allowing for it? Of course, yes, there is a narrative. Yes, there are angels. The government is taking over. Yes, there are lovely mm -hmm. stories and narratives that are on the imaginative spaces. But either in, my only question is, is it a platform for them to experience that? Or is it aiding to the psychosis? So that's a great question about, um, this was, I was trained in the same way, okay. that don't, don't, go into the, don't go into the psychotic material. So, um, but what I've really found is that you wanna, you're holding those problem stories in a way that you're deconstructing them. So you can, you can and you can be, you can have that complex relationship. In other words, um, if someone say is hearing a voice, it can be, well, what is the voice saying? Because first of all, they're living with this all the time, so you wanna really understand their felt experience by asking them what's happening. And is, it, is the voice speaking to you kindly? Is it helpful? Is it unhelpful? And then they can really situate it and have a relationship with that voice. If it turns out that the voice is actually, they disagree with the voice's conclusions and the voice is unhelpful, you can have a metaphor around that voice. Like, some, some voices are like an unwelcome guest, for example. Some voices are actually, you know, a, a harmful stranger. You know, and some voices are actually um, a, a, a whimsical companion. I mean, it's very different what it might be. And then once, you've, once they've made a decision about what their relationship with is, it, or, or paranoia, paranoid ideas, those can be, paranoia can be externalized, and then uh, is it helpful or unhelpful? And people can have a relationship to it. So then if, if that unhelpful voice or unhelpful idea of paranoia you know, you can deconstruct its operations. How does it, when is it likely to show up? What does it say? And how do you want to relate to it? And so it allows people, it allows it to be contextualized and circumscribed, and they can have a different relationship to it. Um, and so it's actually been incredibly empowering. 
for people to do that. So it doesn't in any way, I have never found that it actually increases the psychosis at all. What it does is it, it, it engages the person's observational skills in looking at it. You're enhancing the, you're, what, we're, what I'm always trying to do is enhance, uh, is distinguish the person's own values and intentions for their life from the values and intentions of the problem for their life, whether or not it's psychosis or something else. And then when I can find out what their own values are for their life, to, to be honoring those and strengthening that and weakening the unwanted story that the problem is telling. So it's in that way that I work. I mean, it's like when you work in narratively, like, I, no, I can't remember who said it, but like not all stories are equal. The important stories, the stories you want to prioritize are those that have to do with a person's own values and intentions and life commitments and life purposes. And whatever stories the, the problem is generating or stories that support the problem, those were, we're demoting those stories to lesser status. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. We come to the end of uh, day one at the room full of stories. Uh, but before we end, we have a few announcements to make. Uh, well, those of you who have registered for the dinner tonight, uh, just want to reconfirm that it's called the Hotel Marine Plaza. So if you all can you know, be there by about 7.30, that would be great. And uh, the storytellers at the poster uh, presentation, people who have not yet got a chance to see the posters, they're still up because the storytellers will be removing the posters today uh, because there'll be new 10 posters that will be up tomorrow morning. So in case if you want to catch up. And thank you to every one of you sitting here for making this day special for us, to all the storytellers, all the authors of the posters, as well as everyone attending. Thank you. And we'll thank see you, you so tomorrow much. at 10. Sorry. Um.